I thank you for how my God has by your grace and grace that we are still alive. At this moment, I pray, committing your servant Isaac into your care, that may you speak through him, minister through him, let your word be impacted through him, speak for him and through him. And at the end, I believe he will give you the glory. We thank you for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, do I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Once again, each and every person is welcome. We are currently looking at day 51 of the 100 days of prayer. If I reckon well, we are within the 7th or 8th week. I believe the organizers will clarify that. But as my presentation is concerned, I would want to clarify that the overarching theme for this week's set of lectures or set of discussions is disappointment and missed visions disappointments and missed visions usually the themes may come as deep and may require more understanding as we go along and that is how i want it to be i would always want the presentation to keep you informed then challenge you to think Many Seventh-day Adventists and in extension, people who are waiting for the second coming of Christ should be people who are ready to think, people who are ready to delve deeper, not follow the status quo, people who are ready to go beyond the normal, of course, not abnormality, but go beyond what people have always pegged themselves to be at. Once again, disappointments are missed visions. Actually, what inspired me to think about and even talk about this particular theme is what Peter began when he was presenting his set of presentations. I had been thinking about a lot of things when I was told I had a slot which I would be presenting a lot of things. However, after going through what Peter said, I was challenged to continue in a particular direction, especially within the context of prophecy. And tonight, we would want to begin with a continuation which takes a different path from what he began with. Peter began with visions being rare, when visions become rare. But I want to talk about a particular line of thought which discusses visions in a different trajectory. So I'm thinking about before visions becoming rare, the prophetic sense of that. We all know the story of 9-11. Everyone who was born before the 2000s is privileged to have heard about 9-11. Of course, standing for what happened in September in 2001, the 11th of September. Friends, if you reckon very well, and for the sake of some of us, maybe, who may have not heard about such an event, I would want to give a clear picture to you. Then we reason together, then delve deeper into our discussion for tonight. September morning. The sun rose over New York City. It cast a golden hue on the bustling streets below. We know that New York City is a city that is always alive. It harms with the sounds of a new day. Birds will be chirping. Then we see the skyscrapers, the yellow taxis, and all of these things were clarifying the fact that New York was busy in that particular day. Office workers with coffee in their hand, they were walking to and fro to their destinations. The world's worries had been forgotten because of the morning routine in New York City. The sky was clear, perfectly blue. There was no mask of a single cloud. Now, as the morning went on, minutes ticked away. Then it brought the city closer to an unimaginable moment that would forever alter its course. What am I talking about? At 8.46 a.m., something happened. The roar of jet engines filled the sky, growing louder and more louder by the second. In an instant, the first plane struck the North Tower, a fiery explosion tearing down its facade. The ground shook, and a mass of smoke and debris 
billowed into the sky, turning the blue expanse into ash and sorrow. Friends, you and I can tell that panic swept through the streets as sirens were wailing. Brave souls rushed towards the chaos driven by a duty to save lives. Firefighters, policemen, and ordinary citizens became heroes in those moments. The towers, which were once seen as a pride, burned with an intensity that defied belief. The city, the nation, and the world all watched stunned in silence as the events unfolded. Friends of God, at 9.59 a.m., the South Tower collapsed, followed by the North Tower at 10.28 a.m. Both of them crumbled down in a cloud of dust. As I went through this particular story, the question I was asking myself is this. Had these people who call themselves physics anecdotes, people who are technologians, engineers who know what they do when they are fixing a lot of stuff, when it comes to the the, the roofs, when it comes to the, the, the building materials, how they put them together to complete a structure. When they were going about their businesses, had they ever thought that a particular time was coming where they would fall into a deep sleep and eventually resulting in a chaos? Then I sum up the questions in my mind in this particular one. Was there a vision? Many skeptics around the world always talk about how this particular happening may have been given signs and warnings. Friends, I believe you are getting captivated. The question I am asking is mournfully answered by one Ellen G. White. Many of us as Seventh-day Adventists may, one way or the other, have a particular distaste for this particular prophetess. But here is what she writes on one of the most important events that happened in the history of the United States of America. Ellen White says, On one occasion, when in New York City, I was in the ninth season called upon to behold the buildings rising story after story toward heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof. They were erected to glorify their owners and builders. Higher and still higher, these buildings rose, and in them, the most costly material was used. As I continue, those to whom these buildings belonged were not asking themselves, how can we best glorify God? The Lord was not in their thoughts. Now let me end with a climax. The scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty and supposedly fireproof buildings and said, they are perfectly safe. But these buildings were consumed as if made of pitch. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate the engines. Where am I reading this? Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 12 and 13. I hope you got that. The key points I cannot miss, and I believe you also cannot miss, from the extract I read from the Spirit of Prophecy are these. We can draw some parallels from what happened and the current happening as Ellen White describes. Ellen White tells us that the vision that he had or she had was in New York City. It is very clear that the destruction of the World Trade Centers, that particular happened, took place in New York City. Skeptics who think that probably what she said was never meant for that particular happening can be termed wrong from this instance. Secondly, Ellen White specifies that the buildings were warranted to be fireproof. And it is true. The engineers who built the Twin Towers tell us that they were designed with advanced engineering standards of the time, including fireproof measures intended to prevent catastrophic failure. Once again, the vision was right. Thirdly, we are told, according to the account of Ellen White, that the buildings were erected to glorify their owners and builders. You and I know that countries such as the United States of America 
always project whatever they do to glorify their territorial integrity. In other words, whatever the U.S. does is supposed to hail the U.S. and the U.S. alone at the detriment of other superpowers like Russia, China, Germany, and the others. Indeed, we are told by the engineers that the construction of the World Trade Center was a monumental engineering achievement. He said to there had never been such an engineering before. Once again, the vision was right. Then let me continue so that I will whet your appetite. Ellen White specifies that those who were the owners of the World Trade Center rejoiced with ambitious pride. In fact, they didn't have the Lord in their thoughts. It is complimented that during the time of the World Trade Center, because of the busy commerce, the successful completion and operation of the World Trade Center filled its owners and the business community with pride. It symbolized America's dominant position in global economics. Let me continue. Once again, what I read from the extracts, remember I read from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 12 and 13, tells us that that particular building, the monumental achievement, the World Trade Center, provoked the envy of neighboring nations. Once again, we are all aware that this particular world of ours is a battlefield which is the survival of the fittest. The engineers and those who completed the construction of the World Trade Center tell us that this particular accomplishment was supposed to provoke the envy and resentment both domestically and internationally. Nations like Russia and China have often viewed American dominance with a mix of admiration and rivalry. I cannot go on without talking about the money that went into the construction. Ellen White tells us that that particular money was obtained through exaction, okay, through grinding down the poor. And we are told, of course, even the current running of the world tells us that America thrives fully on the salaries and the foreign exchange of foreigners. And indeed, we are told that America, by virtue of what they had amassed from foreign exchange, invested in the World Trade Center. Now, to the main points. E.G. White said, there was an alarm of fire. And as I read, it is very clear, anyone who has had the opportunity to watch the documentaries of 9-11 can specify clearly that the fire that quenched down that building was nothing short of something closer to hell. Friends of God, I initially began by asking the question that, was there a vision? Before the tearing down of the World Trade Center, had people been told that something of the sort was going to ever happen? And that brings my mind back to the overarching theme, before visions become rare. We can tell for a fact that the current system of the world has placed people in a state where we feel that the world is lacking vision. The Lord is silent. Even the people who are closely knitted to the church system, I'm talking about the clergy, the pastors, the elders, many people are thinking that the world is now tramping into a deep sleep such that there is no vision. And as we have clarified, it is clear that before the destruction of the World Trade Center, there was a vision. E.G. White, availing herself, had been used by God to predict the precise city, the precise spot, the type of destruction, and the engineers even to the extent of describing the whole framework of the World Trade Centers. Friends, it is clear that the vision had been given before the destruction. Where am I driving at? I want us to now link whatever we are going to study onward in four very important points. We are going to look at the significant role of visions. And I want you to know these things now perfectly because they are going to set the foundation of all our discussions throughout the week. 
they happen to be the objectives of our study. Number one, don't forget, is the significant role of visions. Number two, we are looking at the antecedents of visions. When I say antecedents, I mean things or events that necessitated the visions. Events that resulted in the giving of the visions. Number three, we are also going to discuss the aftermath of visions. What are the consequences when visions are given? Then finally, we are going to answer particular questions regarding visions becoming rare. Now go with me. This is a prophetic study once again. So I wouldn't like it that you just listen to me. I want you to reason with me. And if possible, keep some notes down. Let me ask, what do you think is a significant role of visions? We are told by the Bible, and that will be the bedrock of our study. Of course, as we go along, I will be led by God to bring in a lot of technological stuff which are going to help us to understand the times in which we are. But for now, let's begin from the Holy Scriptures. Amos chapter 3 verse 7 tells us that the Lord God doeth nothing unless he has revealed his plans to his servants, the prophets. What is the meaning of this? The role of visions is for God to reveal his intentions to his prophets, to his people, in other words. We can also say that visions serve as a particular channel by which God communicates the events which are about to happen to his people. It further postulates that roles of visions are very significant. And that is the reason why, if you remember clearly, just before the Pentecostal happening in Acts chapter 2, God through Joel had given a vision through prophecy, saying, Joel chapter 2, 28, 29, And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions, even on my servants. Both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. This is what the Lord spoke, the vision that he gave through Joel. And we are no surprise, just as Ellen White visioned or envisioned, and it happened in New York City in 2001. The same thing happened in the Pentecostal era, during the apostolic regeneration and revival. In Acts chapter 2 verse 17, we are told, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. We can clarify that visions play a very significant role in the world as we have it today. But visions, we are being told, have become rare. However, before they became rare, what were the antecedents? Anytime visions are rare, it is usually because those visions have antecedents or events which actually brought those visions into play. Let me put it this way. As it stands now, every Seventh-day Adventist or every person you ask concerning visions probably he or she has experienced, none may be able to tell you he or she has seen any vision. It is very clear that as it stands now in our current dispensation, Visions are totally rare. But what I want to think about, and I believe I want to encourage you to also understand, is that before visions are rare, usually visions are given. And when visions are given, they are given because certain events cause them to be given. And that is where I want us to arrive at as we continue. That is the particular quotation our brother Peter gave us as we discussed Visions becoming rare. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, we are told, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. As I was thinking about this, I asked myself, But why? Why were there not many visions? In fact, the Bible is clear, there were not many visions. Why? What was the problem? Then I realized that the reason why there were not many visions was because there had been visions. 
it sounds a bit perplexing. But when you think through what I'm saying, the moment there is no light in a particular room, there is darkness. So when we are talking about the absence of light, then of course we are discussing darkness. In the same vein, visions can be rare only when visions have already been given. And that is what we call the antecedents, events that led to those visions being given. Let me take you through the historic nature of the Israelite system. We are told that before the time of Samuel, and remember we read 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible clarifies that 300 years prior to the birth of Samuel, I mean from the time of the death of Joshua up unto the time of the birth of Samuel, there was some 350 to 390 years in between. That was a time called the time of the judges. This time falls within the era of the judges where there was a cyclical pattern of Israelites falling into sin. They are oppressed by their enemies, they will cry to God, and then they are delivered by a judge. So it is no surprise that in the book of Judges, 21 verse 25, we are told that in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. I hope you heard me clearly. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did as they saw fit. So if I felt like if I kill my brother, I'm going to get a particular parcel of land. I did so. If I'm lucky, I'm not going to face any problems. If not, I'm going to face the wrath of other tribes of Judah. Mind you, these people were all descendants of Abraham. We are also told the same example was actually happening in the context of Israel. The stubbornness of Israel happens to be an antecedent. That is the event that preceded the visions and the predictions of Moses. I hope you are not lost. Let me clarify one or two things to bring you back into the path. I'm talking about antecedents of visions. Before visions are given, certain events cause those visions to be given. So, in the normal layman's term, before the vision concerning the destruction of Jerusalem was supposed to be given, Certain events, which of course encompasses the stubbornness of Israel, necessitated the giving of the vision. And I'm giving you examples. For example, the stubbornness of Israel during the 40 days of wilderness caused Moses to give visions concerning how Israel was going to fare during the time of the judges. Do you know that, aside that, there is another example where The stubbornness of the kingdoms of Israel. Remember, Israel later was divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Then we are told that the stubbornness of the kingdoms of Israel necessitated the visions of the prophets. Friends, whenever visions are given, they are given because certain antecedents, certain events occurred. The next point, of course, I want us to discover, I want us to discuss, or I want to reason with you with, is the aftermath of visions. When visions are given, what are the results? Mind you, we have talked about the significant role of visions, the roles that visions play. We have understood that visions are given so that God can communicate with his people. Number two, we have discussed the antecedents of visions events that happen which call for visions to be given and in the context of israel especially in the context of samuel we understood that the time of the judges because of the moral decadence because of the stubbornness of the israelites visions were given such that in the time of samuel those visions had ceased we have also discussed examples like the kingdoms of israel okay where Visions were given because the Israelites were stubborn, and God used those visions to prophesy the results of those sins. The third point we have to discuss is the aftermath of visions. When visions are given, what are the results? Friends, there are three very important results 
whenever visions are given. Number one, when visions are given, it propels certain group of people to be revived and be reformed. However, another group of people will only slide steeply in moral decline. If you missed that, let me repeat. Whenever visions are given, there is a revival or reformation for one class of people. Then there is a steep moral decline of another class. And that is what we see throughout the history of the Bible. You see, there is something I want us to take very keen look at as I discuss what we are going through. Everything that happens in the Bible is actually a repetitive cycle of God trying to fill people and bring them to the light. And people trying to fill God and live outside the light of God. And that is what happens throughout the Bible day in, day out. Back to where I was starting. A revival or reformation for one class of people and a moral decline for another class. In the case of Israel, once again, prior to the prophets, when I say the prophets, the Isaiah, the Daniels, the, the Jeremiah, before those people were given visions, it is very clear that when Israel had gone into a particular apostasy, which is the antecedent, they had been now ordained to give visions. Then when they gave those visions, it stirred up the hearts of a particular group of people to change their habits. Then it only increased a particular group of people to be more stubborn in their sin. In the same vein, we see that when visions were given during the apostolic church, when Peter, for example, when you read Acts chapter 11, when Peter has saw a vision of a tree where different kinds of unclean meat were, were given, and later he understood the vision, when the apostolic generation was moving on and on and on, expanding the church of God, they realized that a particular group of people had now been revived and reformed while another group were steeply morally declining. Once again, in our current dispensation, don't forget we are discussing the aftermath of visions, the results of visions. In our current dispensation, when visions are given, the aftermath is supposed to be that just prior the second coming of God, there will be two classes where one is revived by those visions and one is morally declined by those visions. The next step is that we may be awakened to the signs and the positioning we will take after those visions are given. Let me take it in a simple way. When visions are given, either we are revived or we continue the sins that we are doing. Then, when we have taken such a stand, it's either we are awakened to the signs then we become a remnant or otherwise. So this continues throughout the biblical narrative where the aftermath of visions awakens God's people to the signs and that is why visions become rare. I hope you understand where I'm coming from. The reason why God used Peter to tell us that visions have become rare is because, number one, visions have been given where people have been revived and continually are being revived, while others are morally declining. And when visions, those visions were given, which of course encompasses the writings of the spirit of prophecy and the various prophecies in the Bible, some of us have been awakened to the signs of the end time and have positioned ourselves as the remnant. Then finally, like I said, because these two things have happened, visions will become rare. So that those who have positioned themselves properly, being awakened by the signs of the fulfillment of those visions, can now enter into the fulfillment of the visions and the judgment that comes after. Friends, from where we started, we understood and clarified that an example of the World Trade Center tells us that visions were given. But during the decline of the World Trade Center, during the collapse of the World Trade Center, visions were rare. 
And through our discourse, we have understood that before visions become rare, there has to be antecedents. Then through that, we are now going to realize the pinpointing factors that show that indeed visions have become rare. Now let me go in a very clear manner. This time I'm not going to speak a lot of words. Before visions become rare, number one, visions would have met their significant signs and their time would have been up. And I don't need to give examples concerning this particular point. Before visions can become rare, those visions that we expect would have met their signs. So in the context, for example, of what we read in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, we saw that vision concerning the destruction of the World Trade Center had been given, of course, in the 19th century. More than 100 years later, it happened. But during the time it was happening, those visions were not given. The visions came prior to the happening of the event. And it is very fascinating to understand that before the collapse of the World Trade Center, there were significant signs. Engineers could sense that the, the aura around the buildings was not the normal, even though business was going on smoothly. So if you forget anything, remember that before visions become rare, visions would have met their significant signs and their time would have been up. Secondly, before visions become rare, before we enter into a state where we do not have people saying we have gotten visions, we have seen this and that, before those times come, and this is the current dispensation we find ourselves, before this, we would have had enough evidences to direct us against disappointments and remain steadfast with God. What am I trying to say? The reason why we are not experiencing visions now is because the people of God, even those who don't identify with God's people, have enough evidences to direct us. I don't think anyone can disapprove what I just said. All the evidences in the Bible are so clear and enough for our time. And that is why visions have become rare. Thirdly, before visions become rare, we would have reached the appointed transition period. And this is where I would want us to be very, very focused as I bring the proceedings to an end. Once again, before visions would become rare, we would have reached the appointed transition period. Now, let me give you a gist of the transition periods in the biblical timeline. Wherever you are, if you are sleeping, if you are not attentive, please, by the mercy of God, spare me just about 10 minutes of your time at this particular juncture. If you take a cursory look at the biblical accounts, you can know and understand that when Israel came out of Egypt, visions were given. God, through Moses, predicted what Israel was going to do when they had landed in the land of Canaan. I don't need to quote a lot of biblical references concerning this. God had told the Israelites that you people are stiff-necked. And because of that, because of your stubbornness, even with this 40 years of wanderings, these are the things you are going to face in the land where I'm going to give you. Friends of God, when Israel had left Egypt, during the discourse with Moses, God gave them several prophetic visions. Now, when you move along, as we have already discussed, we realize that during the time of Judges, as I told you earlier on, just before the crowning of Samuel, and of course the crowning of David after Saul, between the death of Joshua and the monarchical rule of Israel. When I say monarchical rule, I mean when Israel was now ruled by kings. In between those times was the period of the judges. And that is the period, personally, I call the liberal Israel. Where people were doing things as they wanted. It was a liberal lifestyle. And that is where visions were rare. Then finally... Right after the judges period, the kingdom of Israel was established. 
there was a transition into a kingdom. So Israel from Egypt, visions were given. After that, the liberal lifestyle of the Israelites during the Judges period, there were rare visions. Then right after that, Israel transitioned into a kingdom rule. Another example, we see in the biblical timeline that Israel from Babylon, visions were given. We see the visions of minor prophets like Nahum, Habakkuk, and all of the others. During a time that Israel was moving out of Babylon, in the same way they had moved out of Egypt, there were a lot of visions circulating here and there. We can never forget about the visions of Daniel. Neither can we forget about the voluntary services of Ezra and Nehemiah. That was the time when Israel was on the brink of leaving Babylon. Visions were given. Then right after that, we see period, a period, what I call the intertestamental period. When the Israelites had left Babylon after 70 years of captivity, where visions were given, they had now entered into another liberal lifestyle. Where in other cases, you can compare it to the judges period. They had now entered into a period where visions were rare. Now look at the fascinating thing. They were transitioning to receive the kingdom of grace of Christ. Thirdly and finally, where we are now as a people. Spiritual Israel, which you and I by faith are part. God's people, before we had gotten into this place, you and I can tell for a fact that God through the people like the, 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 the reformers, the, the, those who were revolutionizing the church, those who stood for the right, though the heavens fell, these people, the pioneers of the church, were receiving visions because the church, which is the spiritual Israel, was leaving the Catholic system. Israel left Egypt. Israel left Babylon. Now, Israel is leaving another Babylon in the context of the Catholic system. Then, right after that, where you and I are currently finding ourselves, visions are rare because of liberal lifestyle. Then what happens next? There is a transition to receive Christ's kingdom of glory. When I read these things, when I go through these, I become so happy. And anyone who is closer to me, when you see me going through some of these prophetic reasonings, you see me smiling along the line. Because, like I said, before visions become rare, visions would have met their significant signs, number one. Visions would have been given to give us enough evidence to direct us against disappointments. Number two. Then thirdly, we would have reached the appointed transition period. And the examples I've given all augment this particular point. Once again, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, <laughs> the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Compare that to our day. Yes, like Peter said, visions have become rare. But through the mercies of God, we are also saying that before visions become rare, we would have reached an appointed transition period. Why? A transition is near. A transition is about to happen. And that is why it is no surprise that like Israel of old during the time of the judges were living a liberal lifestyle. As I told you, we are told in Judges chapter 21 verse 25 that in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. That is the same situation we are finding ourselves. Just as Israel left Egypt, visions were given. Then after that, they lived a liberal lifestyle. We spiritual Israelites have come out of Babylon. And now, just before the transition into Christ's kingdom of glory, we are also living a liberal lifestyle. And that is why visions are rare. Friends, before visions become rare, transition is near. The question is, are you ready? 
it is no surprise that visions are rare because previously visions have been given. I want to take this particular moment so that we enter into about 10, 15, 20 minutes of prayer. I had envisioned that I would end my presentation in an hour time, and luckily enough, I have done that. But for the sake of those of us who have actually understood the precepts of what we have discussed, I believe it is equally important that we have a season of prayer. The overarching theme, as I earlier stated, is disappointments and missed visions. And tonight we have discussed that before visions become rare, we would have had enough evidence to direct us against disappointments. Now, what I'm really thinking about is that it is rather unfortunate that people in our current time, pastors inclusive, elders inclusive, church clerks and administrators inclusive, we have become disappointed because visions are rare. And that will be the bedrock of this week's study. I would crave your indulgence. Please don't miss even an evening and continuously follow this season set of prayers. The question is, while this transition goes on, are you ready? And that is why I am allowing myself to go through the disappointments amidst visions.